Hello and welcome to News Click. It has been more than a year since protesters in Kashmir pelted stones against security personnel and establishment in Kashmir Valley. An initially unresponsive government adopted a piecemeal approach to address the concerns related to human rights violations and uh, alienation among the Kashmiris. Has this approach managed to convince the protesters a year on? We have with us here Mr. Sujat Bukhari, a senior journalist based in, the Srinagar, based in Srinagar, and Professor Gulwani, who is a professor of political science at the Kashmir University. And we shall discuss, we shall ask these questions to them. Uh, let me ask the first question to you, Professor Gulwani. Uh, the group of interlocutors uh, engaged in uh, dialogue with various sections of the Kashmiri society uh, has come up with a report which is now with the Home Ministry. Uh, what did you make of the exercise? Uh, do you think it has come up with something fruitful at all? I mean, it is, uh, I think, premature to comment on the content of the report because it has still not been thrown into the public domain. Uh, and we wish that this report comes into the public domain for a wider and comprehensive discussion. Yes, of course, uh, it initially suffered with a certain uh, deficit, legitimacy deficit in the sense uh, that uh, those of the people who are essentially calling the shots on the Kashmir's political turf in uh, 2010, that is the uh, Hurriyat and the separatist groups, uh, were essentially not on board as far as interlocutors were concerned. Despite the fact that interlocutors did try to reach out to them, they made several attempts to reach out to them, but possibly on the Delhi Srinagar track, there is a huge trust deficit which is the result of years of mismanagement of the Kashmir affairs by government of India, which essentially has led to a situation that interlo the, I mean the uh, Hurriyat leaders, separatists uh, did not come uh, on board. Uh, uh, be that as it may, there are of course issues that the interlocutors have gone into 22 districts. They have uh, in fact met many delegations, many students, university teachers, trade union. And from that point of view, it is essential, I think it is very important uh, that this report comes into the public domain and see how essentially different issues mm -hmm. concerning Jammu and Kashmir state, concerning two regions and sub-regions have been hammered out mm -hmm. by the interlocutors. Mm -hmm. I think it is in that sense that the report is very important. Do you think it would have been better if a, a political team had gone as part of the interlocutor committee? And Yes, at that time there were, uh, there were very concrete suggestions considering the fact that uh, there is a huge accumulated experience on Kashmir as far as interlocutors are concerned. Uh, at one time, uh, uh, I mean, a case, uh, what is called as uh, uh, even the present governor, uh, uh, Vora, um, then uh, uh, Arun Jatley. So many other people were deployed from time to time to interlocute uh, on Kashmir. Uh, and many of these initiatives uh, essentially did not yield positive results, either that uh, they did not have clear mandate or that uh, these were in fact uh, uh, not uh, in a way taken to in a manner in which they should have taken, should have been taken. It was in that particular backdrop, that particular context that uh, the suggestion was that let there be political leaders. Uh, but then on political leaders, uh, there were uh, some leaders who would have been acceptable to a cross-section of society in Jammu and Kashmir, but uh, they did not accept that offer. It went like that. But in any case, I think uh, uh, since this report is not being taken as something final, and it cannot be final, because Kashmir has dimensions. There are layers and layers of this conflict situation. There is an internal dynamic. There is an external dynamic. From that point of view, it is important that the contents of this report come into the public domain for a wider comprehensive discussion so that civil society, political establishment, political parties, people living in different parts of Jammu and Kashmir learn from it as to what essentially has uh, yielded uh, as far as this report is concerned. So let me turn to you now. You know, uh, the, uh, the core concern among the protesters was clearly human rights violations that has been, that has gone on in the valley for quite some time now and because of deep militarization, the presence of various draconian laws that has been in practice. Now, th there has been talk of repeal of uh, the AFSPA Act or even amendments in it in uh, wherever it is in place and so on and so forth, but uh, do you think anything concrete has happened in this? Uh, 
I don't think, I mean, uh, at the time we are discussing the issue, I think the latest news pouring in from Srinagar is that uh, the state cabinet which met today had, could not reach uh, to a consensus on the Armed Forces Special Powers Act after you know that uh, there was a lot of uh, commotion which was happening for the last two, three days when Umar Abdullah said on October 21st that he would uh, order the repealment of the act from certain areas in Kashmir and Jammu. And after that, the Ministry of Defense expressed its own reservations and yesterday only the Congress, which is the main ally of National Conference in the coalition government, they said that they have not been taken into confidence. So I think as of now, uh, one can uh, conclude very easily that all the parties were playing to the galleries as far as the withdrawal of AFSA is concerned. I think uh, uh, talking about the AFSA and its withdrawal, there is no denying the fact that withdrawal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is very important to allow people of Jammu and Kashmir and especially Kashmir Valley to breathe because the way the AFSA has been misused by the security forces in the past 21 years to cover up their own criminal acts, I think it's time that uh, the people who have been responsible for those uh, grave human rights violations like uh, Patribal encounter, Gandharbal fake encounter and many other cases, I think it's time that they should be brought to the book. So for that matter, I mean, wherever the operational uh, duties uh, they're discharging, uh, AFSA is a cover-up for them and AFSA, AFSA has to uh, go in that sense. But I think the larger problem in Jammu and Kashmir is the strength of the troops on the ground. The deployment of the tro troops is very important to be addressed because unless and until you thin out the troops, you send the troops to the barracks, I don't think you can expect an, a situation where people can say that they are free and uh, I mean their movement is free. If you, I mean, if you look at Srinagar, Srinagar has no problem, it's a normal place in that sense. But if you go to the rural areas, to the countryside, the situation is very bad and there is, I mean, I would say that easily that the uh, number of the tr uh, troops who are on the ground are disproportionate. Uh, to the requirements on the ground in the backdrop of uh, the statistics which have been released by the Home Ministry only yesterday that the violence level has dipped to a very great extent, militancy is on van, infiltration is on decline. So all these factors when you look at them, I think there is no need for so much of uh, the troops on the ground. Is so there any consensus among the mainstream politi political actors for demilitarization? I think demilitarization has been a long pending demand of uh, not only the uh, political parties across the spectrum in Kashmir Valley, but uh, largely the people have been demanding this. Uh, I don't know, I mean, but unfortunately the mainstream parties like PDP, National Conference uh, have been using this as an uh, electoral plank and uh, they have also been using it to uh, appease a political uh, vote bank for that matter. And obviously the separatists have this on their agenda. But I think largely the people in Jammu and Kashmir do want that uh, uh, if at all the peace has prevailed, which I believe uh, is not, uh, I mean, permanent kind of a thing because peace in Jammu and Kashmir is very fragile. Uh, any situation like muscle fake encounter, I mean, that can kick start another round of uh, unrest in Kashmir. So I think in order to uh, gain, as Professor Vani was rightly saying, that there is severe trust and confidence deficit between Srinagar and New Delhi as far as people are concerned. So in order to actually regain that confidence and trust vis-a-vis -vis the state, uh, I think it's very important that uh, the majors like uh, the withdrawal of the uh, draconian laws like uh, uh, Armed Force Special Powers Act and misuse of the Public Safety Act by the state uh, is very important and the thinning out of troops is also very important. Though the larger problem of Jammu and Kashmir is of uh, is a political problem and unless and until you really uh, come out with uh, a solution to address the political problem of Jammu and Kashmir which is about uh, the determination of the future of the state, I think that's a very important issue but at the same time I mean, obviously the human rights violations have been the biggest source of irritation and biggest source of uh, problem in Jammu and Kashmir. Just before I get to the political problem, there is also the issue of reparations for uh, various crimes that have been committed uh, by both militant and the state actors uh, in the state. Apparently, the state uh, um, human rights commission recently uh, recommended that DNA profiling should be done to of, uh, of uh, bodies found in unmarked graves. Uh, surely, that is an issue you think uh, 
that uh, that has to be you know taken up immediately i mean certainly it is very important that, that an indigenous native institution uh, state human rights commission has come out with a report and remember that state human rights commission also mm -hmm. was under cloud for a uh, great deal of time since its establishment uh, not only that uh, uh, many of the reports that it produced were not implemented but because of the fact that this uh, entire institution of state human rights commission did not have necessary infrastructure to work freely and fairly uh, on jammu and kashmir state now this time it has come out with a report it is very important uh, i mean before we start addressing other dimensions of kashmir that on the internal track we find that how these issues related to disappearances abductions killings fake encounters are essentially taken up i mean it is expected of a country uh, which uh, obviously uh, is uh, considered as a largest democracy in the world at this point of time uh, that uh, uh, indian state uh, uh, provides the necessary uh, uh, what is called as uh, the, the, the 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 larger environment for state human rights commission to play its uh, uh, meaningful role at this point of time so that these cases are taken up there are other suggestions for example uh, that truth and reconciliation commission should be established but uh, that entire thing is in the public domain there is a lot of discussion going on that uh, whether we have reached to a situation of a uh, conflict resolution or it is merely a stage which you can refer as con conflict stabilization that it has been stabilized and this point of time probably uh, trc a uh, truth and reconciliation cannot be thought of uh, at this point of time short of that what is very important is that if you allow the local institutions like state human rights commission that its reports are taken cognizance of and necessary mechanisms and arrangements are evolved whereby justice is not only done to those who feel uh, in a way let down by the law enforcement machineries over a period of time but it is also being seen to be done yes, yes, yes. it is in that sense that uh, that will be definitely a very credible step towards uh, removing not only the trust deficit but also arresting alienation right. to a point because i think uh, un, uh, this all this uh, when i say in a certain context that the entire conflict has layers and layers right. but uh, it is uh, certainly very important that uh, how actually you start working on the internal dynamic right. and in that how actually to begin with you start reaching out to those who still are waiting for uh, those who have disappeared to return to their homes right. i mean there are very multiple questions and there is a huge writing on the wall right. there are many associations that have come up as far as the association of disappeared persons is concerned Uh, there are very sensitive issues connected to it the issue of widows half widows and i mean half widows is a category that you find it is a type of a new identity that some kashmiri women have that who still are waiting to know whether their husbands have disappeared they have been killed or they still can in fact uh, can be retrieved they can come back that being a tragic situation the core issue is still a political one now in the mid 2000s we saw some kind of a thaw where we had a tripartite uh, set of talks between the indian government the pakistani government and also set of actors in kashmir and uh, you know different ideas were thrown up innovative and original even positive ideas in terms of soft borders in terms of autonomy and so on and so forth but after a while these things petered out uh, you know what do you think needs to be done to get back that momentum that was generated some See, I think I I think the uh, the most important phase in uh, uh, the India-Pakistan relations vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir was uh, uh, from 2003 onwards when the first ceasefire was announced, and after that uh, there was a sustained peace process between uh, under the leadership of Vajpayee and uh, Musharraf on the other side. I think uh, that was the most important period we have seen in Kashmir when something was uh, being uh, actually. Uh, done uh, something we could feel that was happening on uh, jammu and kashmir though the confidence building phases could not be uh, the final solution in itself but these could be actually uh, i mean a very good beginning for reaching to a level where you can have a solution which is amicable and which is acceptable to all the parties concerned so but unfortunately i think after the uh, mumbai attacks the whole process got derailed but uh, thankfully the india pakistan have again uh, restarted the dialogue and uh, they have resumed the 
dialogue between themselves. But it is very important that uh, uh, the reference point for the entire dialogue process has to be where uh, um, Vajpayee and Musharraf had started it in order to address the uh, Jammu and Kashmir problem as the core problem between uh, two, par, uh, two countries. And in that whole process, I think we uh, it is very important to realize that unless and until India and Pakistan reach to a level of uh, reconciliation or some kind of agreement on Kashmir, you, uh, the, uh, there cannot be a workable solution to that. But at the same time, I think it is important to take uh, people of Jammu and Kashmir also into confidence for a solution. Because if you take a decision and make, an, uh, make a unilateral agreement between the two countries, it has to be acceptable to people of Jammu and Kashmir who have given so much of sacrifice for the last 64 years for the political resolution of the problem. So that is the external dimension where we say that the point of reference has to be that dialogue process which started in 2004. But at the same time, I think the internal dimension is very important as Professor Vani was referring to the interlocutor's report. I mean, though there are so many actually uh, apprehensions amo uh, among the people's minds about that report, though we don't know the real contents of the report, uh, we do take it as uh, something as a good beginning because uh, we have no reason to doubt them. But the question is that the separatists who have the problem with the uh, Indian uh, Union as such who say that Kashmir is not part of India in that sense. I mean, they were not part of this uh, whole uh, process. So that surely makes it a one-sided one uh, process. But at the same time, I think if uh, the interlocutors have given some kind of concrete suggestions where from you can begin the real process, the, then I think to that extent it is a good process. But I think people have a right uh, to know that what the report is, it has to be in the public domain so that it is discussed. And there is some kind of implementation because for the past 60 years we have seen that whatever Delhi says, it does not do that. That is the problem because there is a crisis of confidence as he uh, rightly pointed out. So I think Kashmiris have uh, time and again shown that therefore the peaceful resolution of Jammu and Kashmir, their transition from violence to non-violence in the last three years, I think is an uh, example uh, for their, uh, I mean, sense of accommodation for uh, finding a resolution, a political resolution within uh, the ambit of uh, the, I mean, the reconciliation, grand reconciliation between the people and uh, the rest of India. Uh, to finalize, uh, both of you are trying to say that uh, the Indian state has to win the confidence of the Kashmiri people by whittling down the layers of alienation that are set in, uh, first by addressing human rights concerns and then also looking into the answering the political problem solution. Right? Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for.